For all new and current subscribers, welcome back to Resilient Love. Resilient is being able to overcome difficult situations. This podcast is about love, love tips, tips on, on life, life, and how to level up in your business. Let's, Let's get, get started, started on, on the journey. journey. Thank you all again for coming to another episode of Resilient Love. We have with us today, Mr. Alvin Irby. So we appreciate you joining us and closing out our Juneteenth series. Our focus has been about black culture, conversations around improving and empowering our people to excel and be great. You are a former kindergarten teacher and the founder and chief reading inspirer of Barbershop Books. So could you share with us and everyone listening a little more about yourself and just the inspiration behind Barbershop Books? Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Alvin Irby. Um, and as you said, I'm the uh, founder of Barbershop Books. We create child-friendly reading spaces um, in barbershops across the country, and we provide early literacy training to barbers. Um, the Barbershop Books mission is to help young black boys ages four to eight to identify as readers by connecting um, fun books to a male-centered space and by involving black men in boys' early reading experiences. So in a nutshell, um, that is Barbershop Books, and that's, that's what we do. Awesome. <laughs> so we live in North Carolina, by the way. What is the process of a barbershop being a location for barbershop books? So our kind of selection criteria is, is actually quite simple. Um, we just want to know, does a barbershop uh, serve at least 40 boys a month? Um, do they have space? You know, generally... You know, if a barber shop moves their trash can or their coat rack, they can usually accommodate, um, you know, our, our bookshelf. Um, and then the last criteria is really about buy-in from the barber shop owner uh, and or manager. Do they agree to even have um, the reading space um, in their shops? Right now, because of COVID, um, we are uh, currently kind of um, exploring ways to kind of uh, adapt the program so maybe instead of having kids kind of use communal books that are available in a bookshelf maybe um, using some type of book distribution model where we actually kind of give children a small set of books that they can keep and take home um, just because in the current climate you know parents aren't all that uh, excited about having their children touch communal objects in a public space if you get my get my, my drift I, there i do yeah <laughs> yes. that makes sense yes. it makes sense um so with that being said um i'm kind of going to skip down to one of our questions because again you already brought up how go ahead oh i just realized i didn't finish answering your question so you asked me how does a a reading space make it into a barbershop so there there are kind of two main ways Okay. So an individual person, a church, a, a small group of people could sponsor a reading space either through our website or, you know, by creating a, a, a fundraiser on uh, Facebook. Um, and that's just, you know, to make it super easy for anyone looking to kind of promote reading um, in their community. Um, and then the second way is that we partner with school districts, library systems, and, and um, city governments. Um, who are looking to increase out-of-school time reading and book access for Black boys. So we usually work directly with individual community members or we partner with public institutions to kind of implement the program across an entire neighborhood or city. Oh, perfect. Yeah, we, we have some individuals in mind in our community, so we're definitely directing them to your Wonderful. website because... Yeah, again, because you're focused on boys. And um, but another thing that I want to ask, and again, I'm kind of skipping down, is we understand your target audience is boys, but have you what about the girls? I mean, is there I mean, am I being too technical or is it something in the future? Well, you know, yes, barber sh uh shop books, um, you know, targets boys, but we we are currently developing beauty shop books. 
But, but okay. even, with that, even with that being said, you know, one thing that I think is really important to mention, you know, is that, you know, for example, the Susan G. Komen Foundation focuses only on breast cancer, right? True. True. And no one ever comes up to the Susan G. Komen Foundation and says, hey, what about the testes, right? What, what about the prostate? <laughs> well, you yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, it's really important to make space for programming that is customized to a particular audience. And my intention um, and our intention as an organization is that when we develop uh, beauty shop books, it's really going to be geared toward black girls and, and kind of surveying them and finding out what they're most interested in. It's not just going to be simply just duplicating what we're doing with barbershop books, although I'm sure many elements of our barbershop books program will translate, but you know, um, you know, that's really something that we're, we're really kind of focused on is, is making sure that we're keeping the boys front and center as we're developing out the program. Oh, yes, most definitely. It was just, a, you know how, you, this Everyone is Everyone asked that question. Exactly, we exactly. We feel bad at all. We get that question <laughs> all the time, all the time. Of course, right? Even in the classroom, diversity, inclusion, you know right. the deal. So um, going back to one of your interviews you had. Um, the, uh, we heard the NPR interview. And we wanted to ask, could you talk more about the lack of cultural competency in the classroom and even in our communities? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, sometimes adults, people in positions of power or authority can assume that just because of their authority or their position or title, that people are required to know what they're talking about, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And the reality is that no, like if you are requesting people's time and attention, you have an obligation to think about um, how can you communicate or create experiences that whoever that person is or that audience that they'll find relevant um, and engaging. Um, and so, you know, as I think about what's happening in the classroom, I think, you know, a lot of that same thing is happening where there are teachers who have this, have a mindset of, well, if you just listen to me, if you just do what I tell you to do, then you will learn to read, or you'll be better at this, or better at that, or even to parents, you know, your kid will perform better if you just listen to me, and they, they have this idea that just because they have a degree, or just because they have this experience, that that automatically means that whatever way they're communicating is effective, and that's just not the case. I think that how you say things, how you communicate things, and the type of experiences you use to communicate or teach something, those things matter too. So uh, in some, I would say that, you know, what I try and communicate about cultural competency is really how uh, at its core, it's about humility and being humble enough to recognize and accept that any interaction you have with a child, a parent, or anybody, really, you don't come to that interaction knowing uh, everything that you need to know to make that interaction as relevant and as engaging as it could be. And so, well, how do you make it more relevant or more engaging? Well, by being humble enough to recognize that whoever you're talking to, they have something to offer. Yeah. They have something that they can contribute. And I think that sometimes those positions or the, the authority or whatever, can kind of blind people to that reality and thus make their communication less effective or whatever type of curriculum they're designing less effective, right? Mm -hmm. That's good. And I know for me, you know, as, again, as I told you, I'm, I'm in early education. And so we have, my evaluator has really pushed like, get to know the students, get to know their interests, because when you build your lesson or structure your lesson, it's truly to get, cater to what they want to know yeah, and what they want to know is going to literally produce the conversation and the interaction that you desire. One of the challenges though with that is that, you know, what I found, you know, traveling around the country, speaking with a variety of different people um, is that too often I feel like adults care more about what they like or don't like than what inspire children to fall in love with reading. So if a book topic is not something they particularly find interesting or funny, 
well then right you know, this is I, I don't have anything <laughs> to do with it yeah mm -hmm. well that's good that's a good leeway into um your book gross greg like i really like what you said in the when you quoted the book you said you call oh, them boogers. boogers. Greg calls, calls them delicious, delicious little sugars. sugars. It's like, oh, that's cool. That is true. That is true. He does <laughs> call them delicious little sugars. <laughs> <laughs> so what? I mean, I know. Look, 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 though. Look what just happened. We all just laughed. But, you know, <laughs> there are a lot of parents and adults who are like, nah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not reading this to my child. I am not reading this. And, 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 and it doesn't matter if this is the funniest thing their child has ever heard. It doesn't matter if their child is ro rolling on the floor. And for some teachers, it doesn't matter if their students find the book irresistible. They, because they don't like it, they're not going to introduce it to their children or allow their students or, or children to interact with it. And I think that that is, that's, that's part of the challenge for, I think, publishers is that they aren't writing books because children will read them. They're buying books because parents, schools, or libraries will purchase them. Yeah. And that's a, that's a different thing, mm -hmm. right? Because there may be things that a child would love to read, but that a parent or school might be reluctant to purchase. Right. And so a publisher, are they going to publish something that they aren't absolutely sure they'll be able to pitch or sell? Well, probably not. And so then what does that mean for the diversity of children's literature? I know that's a very good point. And I mean, children need like entertainment books just as much as they need educational books. And I like that you are showing, even in that one statement, how it's like a comparing and contrast. It's like making your own inference and giving your own descriptive ideas and imagination. I mean, it's just, it does a lot for the kid in that one little statement. And I mean, the entire book as well. And I mean, you even have an interactive game. So it's like, you took the steps yeah. to make it inclusive and for anybody. Palatable. Huh? Palatable for some, for, for some teachers and adults. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yes, sir. So this, this two-part question, with the advancement of technology, how is barbershop books advancing in digital literacy? So one of the things that we are currently um, developing right now is an e-library. Um, and what we're looking to do is to pretty much um, encourage or inspire a lot of the self-published authors to share their e-books with us. You know, we don't really have a ton of money or anything like that, but we do have parents and librarians and teachers who are like, do you know of any free online resources that have black characters in, them? you know, eBooks or, and we're like, I don't know. I mean, people are asking us this and we haven't been able to really find a single resource that kind of has a lot of these, uh, these type of books and, 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 and digital content that's diverse. And so what we're looking to do is to crowdsource from the black community um, books that people have written. You know, um, because of the cost of self-publishing going down because of websites like Fiverr or Upwork, where an ordinary person, you can actually contract with a professional illustrator in Russia or Turkey or China exactly. to, to illustrate your book. And so... For a few hundred dollars, you can actually, you know, self-publish a quality children's book. And so what that means is that there are lots of potentially quality children's literature that's floating out on the internet, whether it's sitting on Amazon collecting digital dust or it's attached to an old email, right, collecting digital dust. A lot of people, I think, because they're excited about their children's book that they've, you know, written with their child or with a niece or nephew or inspired by someone in their family, they think that once they put it out there, all of a sudden everybody's going to rush and start buying it. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the case. And so you have a situation where you have all of these self-published titles just sitting on yeah. Amazon, not being read by the young people who 
the authors were inspired to write it for. And so what we're hoping to do is to create a, a free online resource for self-published uh, black authors and illustrators uh, and other, you know, eventually other, other uh, authors and illustrators of color. But, you know, we really want to um, try and just um, create a, a resource for parents and educators and librarians. That's really good. And I like the fact that you're allowing it or giving an opportunity for it to be free. And then of course, exposure for others. So they won't have the digital dust lingering <laughs> on right, their materials. Right. <laughs> we're, also, we're also, you know, of course, doing uh, virtual read alouds right now um, on Facebook Live every Tuesday and um, Friday at 11 a.m. We've had child guest readers. So we have had young boys who have uh, led read alouds uh, for our Facebook Live. We've, got, we've also had uh, guest readers where we have, you know, authors um, to um, read on our Facebook Live. Um, but I would say that our e-library um, and um, kind of, you know, our read alouds are kind of two of the main ways in which we are kind of looking to kind of integrate, integrate um, technology into uh, the barbershop books program. That's good. And I did want to make one little comment. I like the fact that you are also educating the barbershop owners about lit early literacy and things of that nature. Like you actually have a curriculum laid out because we went on the website, of course, and reviewed it. And it's, I mean, reviewed what you provide. And so that's really good too, because a lot of people like, because we are in the education field, we have to hear and read and do all that. But a lot of people don't know the techniques, quote unquote. And so I just thought that was really nice too. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why we created our 90 minute uh, early literacy workshop for barbers is to just provide them with some practical tips and strategies they can use um, when, you know, uh, engaging parents around early literacy. And, you know, we're pretty, we're clear, you know, we're not trying to turn barbers into tutors Oh yeah, uh, or, or, or literacy specialists, you know, but we just want to make sure uh, that, you know, they have it some, you know, basic, you know, child development information and they understand kind of, you know, simple things that they can do uh, to support the program and to um, encourage, you know, children to read. Yeah. And, and I also want to just say, I really thank you for doing that because it really creates that, black role model that young black boys do, you know typically don't see based on statistics and that was a, that was intentional from the start you know i actually read an article um entitled stemming the tide or that's the, the main title but it was an article published in um, a psychology journal um and in this article uh it was a study that was done um and the article of course was written up about the, the study um but what they did is they, they surveyed women. They administered this little test to measure women's implicit attitudes toward STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And what they found is that a lot of women did not associate women with STEM. They did not think that they were good at STEM. Um, and so what they did in this study is they exposed these women to other women who were successful in STEM. Mm -hmm. Just to see if over time that would kind of counter their negative self, self stereotypes and if it would, you know, hopefully make them feel more positive about, you know, doing STEM related activities and stuff like that. And it, is, it did exactly what they thought it was going to do by exposing these women to STEM professionals who were women and who were successful, they felt more positive. And I was like, well, you know what? I think that's exactly what's happening with a lot of black boys. Many of them, don't have same-sex role models who can model and encourage um, them to read and also, um, you know, just talk to them about, about reading. So um, definitely, uh, I would agree with you that, like, involving um, Black men and Black barbers, um, you know, to kind of serve as those same-sex role models was, was important to our, is, is important uh, to our program and was important when we were creating it. Yeah. Very, very good. Very yes. good. <laughs> very good. So our final question is, will there be a potential for you to run for local or state school board? 
<laughs> and we 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 brought this question up because of your educational background and of course what you provide and we see you um as a very strong advocate and, for for leadership in that capacity and just, and just diverse thinking yeah you know this is what i will say <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, I am working on ensuring that Barbershop Books is sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and that is kind of my number one priority is making sure that I'm building an organization um, that can exist um, beyond me. And when I say beyond me, I mean, you know, there's so many businesses that are built around um, an inspiring leader um, but may lack the infrastructure to exist uh, beyond them or without them. And I want to make sure that um, I'm creating something that will not only last, but, th but that can also operate and work independent of me. You know, mm -hmm. so I want to make sure I'm putting the right team members in place with the right skill sets and experience, and I'm building the right type of board uh, that's going to allow us to, to, to be here and be doing this work or whatever important work our communities need as it relates to early literacy um, in the future. Yeah. Well, again, we in the future, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Well, we, we also Who saw your... Who knows? You never know. You never know. Never we know. see it. So. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Um, well, uh, Mr. Irby, did you have anything you want to share with our viewers or listeners before we close well, out? I would say that, you know, one thing that, you know, I try and make sure that I communicate to, you know, anyone who's learning about barbershop books or interested in learning about kind of what we do is, you know, I would say that, um, you know, our main goal is really to cultivate the reading identity of Black boys. You know, so many reading programs, reading initiatives, and you know, writing on 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 reading and black boys, you know, really focuses on skills and you know, a kind of deficit model or deficit thinking where it's like black boys don't have this, black boys don't have that. And you know what what you know what we're trying to to kind of promote is this idea that you know, I guess maybe a metaphor would be more helpful. So. One of the things that we're focused on is book access, first and foremost, because even if you want to read, if you don't have access to books, reading becomes a significant challenge. So, you know, right now in America, there are a lot of children who are essentially being asked to learn how to read. But when you think about their circumstances, it's the equivalent of asking someone to learn how to play the piano, but they literally only have a piano during their piano lesson. Ooh. And then every time they come to their piano lesson, they're having to learn a new lesson. So they're not even able to really review the lesson that they have previously learned. They don't have a piano at home, but then they're being test, tested or assessed, you know, to make sure that they are reading at a level that they're supposed to. But if every time you show up for your piano lesson, you're having to learn a new lesson, mm -hmm. you don't have a piano at home to practice on, well, your progress is going to be slow. And so for me, you know, anytime anybody's talking about reading or helping kids read, my first question is, are we providing the kids with books that they can read at home on their own? Yeah. And if the question is no, then why not? And then the second question is, well, are we creating and providing a type of early reading experiences that will inspire a child to read for fun, read when it's not required? Because so many of the reading interventions and reading programs, they require a trained specialist to be present, which I'm not discounting, you know? Right, right, right. Specialists, teachers who are trained in reading is important. Those things are essential. But what happens when a kid goes home? Exactly. What happened during the summer? What happened? And so one of the things that, you know, I think about is the children who don't have support outside of school. They don't have parents who are buying them books. They don't have parents taking them to the library, right? Those children need to be intrinsically motivated to read, meaning they need to be self-motivated to read because they don't have those external supports in place. 
And so my question for educators, for schools, for a lot of school system, what type of reading experiences are we providing that will cultivate that those children's intrinsic motivation to read? Because if they are not self-motivated to read and they don't have certain supports, mm -hmm. it's not likely that the reading will happen. And, but, and so I think that there's more that schools and educators can do outside of reading kind of reading instruction mm -hmm. that can kind of inspire children um, to read and to increase their, their intrinsic motivation to, to, to learn and read. And so, you know, I think that, you know, that's an important part of our work. And I think sometimes it might get lost in the warm and fuzzy of, oh, you know, they're reading in the barber shop. And it's like, well, for us, you know, it really is a little bit deeper than that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's good. That's so good. Um, I have, I really, really, really am excited. I'm going to be directing a lot of people in the North Carolina area to go and register. Do you register. have a specific barber shop uh, that, that you go to or that you know in your neighborhood? Mm hmm Well, one thing that you could do uh, is talk to that barber shop owner and find out if, if he would be interested um, in promoting reading in his barber shop. And you could literally start your own um, um, you could go onto the barbershop books page, click on fundraiser, and you can literally create your own fundraiser for that barbershop and encourage your friends and family to support, to help sponsor a reading space uh, and or sponsor reading programming for that barbershop. And we can work with you to get um, barbershop books out there. If you want to learn more information about barbershop books, uh, you can visit our website at barbershopbooks.org. You can also connect with us on social media at Barbershop Books on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to connecting again soon. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you. And uh, we appreciate the information you provided, and we hope that Barbershop Books continues to grow and excel. And this has been another episode of Resilient, Resilient Love. Love. Thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to Resilient Love Podcast. We wanted to take this opportunity to also let you know that you can help us by committing to a monthly fee of $0.99, cent, $2.99, or $9.99. Those contributions help us to keep this movement of resilient love going. Blessings to all listeners and subscribers. Thank you all. Resilient, Resilient love. love.